with those enlightenment ideas. Right? What do you think about that? I'm thinking of like uh, McCartney's uh, Henley t-shirt, man. That thing is sweet. Baby blue. I'm thinking we got a lot of revolutionaries uh, or, or revolutions coming up uh, in this next unit. Yeah, so let's um let's get started with the objective for this unit. So the Latin American revolutions are what we're gonna be talking about um today. Um and we are looking at how did the enlightenment ideas of the individual and government influence the Latin American wars for independence. So um the fancy way of saying how did the enlightenment ideas help spark the Latin revolutions. All right, so Mr. Williams, you want to go ahead and take the lead with this one? Yeah, I think the the reason why Mr. Armstrong put this slide together is so that we would have a better idea of what Latin America is. And if you're looking at the map, it's uh, all of South America, all of Central America, and there'll be some islands there in the, in the Caribbean that will be included as well. Uh, even though we're having you look at a map, and this is all based in geography, Latin America is more about the language. Uh, it, it is a collection of the Americas where the, um, the official language is either Spanish or Portuguese. Now, in saying that, ends up being everything you see there in yellow and everything, everything you see there in red. Um, but that's the true meaning of Latin America. Um, and I just want to take a real quick pause here while we have this. And if we look here, this is where Spain and Portugal are located. Um, and it is on a peninsula. So, you know, being surrounded on three sides by, by water, and that'll kind of come into play a little bit later. So, but why we had that image, I wanted to, to highlight that. Um, so specifically, um, the countries that we'll be looking at that for the Latin American revolutions, we got Mexico, Haiti, Brazil, and then South America, which is, um, we're really referring to this area up top. Um, and again, the like the definition of what makes Latin America. So anything else to add here? Or are we good? I think we're pretty good. And kids, just so you know, this is the first time that Mr. Williams and I have done this computer side chat through Google Hangouts. So we aren't actually sitting in the same room together for this one. So if it sounds a little different, that might be why. So we have the social pyramid or the social structure of the Latin Americas. And as you see, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different um, groups. And the at the very top here, we have the top 1% of people who were who are the peninsulars who were born on the peninsula of Spain and Portugal. So again, that was why I kind of wanted to mention that beforehand. They're at the top. They run the government. Um, and as you see, they make up 1%. So Mr. Williams, you want to take with the, the next couple here? Yes. Um, and and how we separate the, the green and the blue or the peninsulares and the creoles is all about where you're born. So where the peninsulares are born in Europe on the Iberian Peninsula, the creoles are the peninsulares' children. And they're born in Latin America, kind of a second uh, generation immigrants, if you will. Um, the mestizos and the mulattoes make up kind of like this third tier. They are uh, a mixture of, if you're a mestizo, a mixture of European descent um, and native descent. Mulattoes is a mixture of European descent uh, and African descent. Um, so they are above native uh, Indians and African slaves because they have European blood um, running through their veins. And that is um, obviously valued since uh, Europe is setting up this social structure. And then again, at the very bottom, we have the native Indians and African slaves, about 61% of the population together. And they are going to be the, uh, that very cheap forced labor base. Awesome. All right. Moving ever onward, we have this um, wonderful timeline, if I will say myself. Um, and at the top, we've got the items that we've already talked about in class. So then down here, we've got the items that we're going to talk about um, today. And just to give you that reference point, uh, it should also help explain the cause and effect of each of these events that that take place um, in Latin America for this revolution for the revolutions here. 
So yep. oh, I'm the, sorry. I just, just to piggyback on what you're saying, the causes of everything we see uh, on the, the top of the arrow ends up, um, you know, making sure that these independence movements happen at the bottom of the arrow. So definitely um, all the causes are up top in Europe. And that's why we spent so much time talking about it, because what happens in Europe is you're going to see over the next couple of units, it affects the rest of the world. And of course, with this unit, Latin America. Awesome. All right. So with the French Revolution from 1789 to 1800, well, 17, so the French Revolution obviously took place in France. And as we um, mentioned during the French Revolution, there was a lot of chaos that was going on. You had um, Robespierre with his reign of terror and you had people getting murdered and yada, yada, yada. Terrible place. So needless to say, the people in France were pretty occupied with being concerned with what was going on in the mother country of France. So so because of that, their territory, one of their colonies, of their colony of Haiti, in 1791, so a couple years after the French Revolution started, they realize these people from France aren't really paying attention. So they have the first and only successful slave rebellion um, that sparked the revolution and caused a revolution, and Haiti ended up getting its independence from a slave rebellion. Yep, and the, the gentleman that you have there in the middle on, on the bottom, that's Toussaint Louverture. He is um, very accustomed to enlightened ideas. Uh, he is an educated person, and he is obviously challenging that right to liberty that obviously slavery um, disagrees with. Fantastic. And we have this image on here of John Locke with Life, Liberty, and Property just to kind of help keep um, you focused on thinking about the lack of liberty or the lack of life and the lack of enlightenment ideas um, as we go through. So to go back to the timeline now, we're now in the Napoleon reign um, in terms of what was going on in Europe. And during Napoleon's reign, we've got the Mexican War for Independence, and we have the South American um, independence. So I believe the next slide is the Mexican independence, though I apologize that it's slightly out of order. Um, so, Mr. Williams, I like yeah, how you use Just one all thing these. I want to add for the next three uh, the Mexican, the South American, and the Brazilian, they all have to do with Napoleon marching into Spain and Portugal and fighting the, the Peninsular War. Uh, and, and the effect are, you know, just like we had with Haiti is this opportunity to rebel and to fight and to gain independence. So to some extent, um, the cause is the fact that everybody else is kind of distracted with what's going on in Europe. And it gives some prime opportunity for these revolutions to occur in the rest of the world. Yeah, it's definitely all about timing. And then if you remember, you know, if we talked about the Louisiana Purchase and class at all, Napoleon just does not care about the Americas. Um, he's not going to put a lot of uh, money or resources or perhaps people in those places to fight against. Um, and so that's why it's such a perfect time. So uh, Mexico, uh, I'll try to keep it brief here. I have some very uh, passionate paintings of what is a local a parish priest. Uh, his name is Miguel Hidalgo. Um, he there's a, there's a day in Mexico. I think it's called the um, the Cry of Dolores, where he is imploring everyone. Uh, he's trying to motivate everyone to fight against Spain. Uh, unfortunately for Mister Hidalgo, he loses this battle. Um, but someone picks up the the torch and uh, carries it on sometime afterwards. So he starts all this in 1810, and then. They finally achieve independence in 24, 1824. Awesome. And this is this is very violent, um, as was the Haitian Revolution. Right, which I feel like these images definitely portray that idea of it being very violent, especially when we look at the, the next one and you look at it in comparison. So um, that was the Mexican independence. The next one that we'll talk about, even though it's, again, it's slightly out of order, at least from the beginning of this one, but the next one we'll talk about is the Brazilian Revolution. Um, the Brazilian Revolution was pretty different from the first two that were mentioned in terms of this one was very, very peaceful. Um, 
So if you remember during the Peninsular War, Napoleon is going through Spain to attack Portugal for um, trading with Britain when they were already told that they shouldn't do that. Well, the king and prince of Portugal decide we're getting out of Dodge before Napoleon comes in here. So they actually pack up and they head to Brazil. Um, after being there for a while, the king realizes that it's safe and all that to be able to return home. So the king goes home, his son stays in Portugal. And before he goes, before the king leaves, he tells the son, if a revolution begins here in Brazil, take the side of the revolution, put the crown on your own head, because it's better to put the crown on your own head and lose some power than it is to be dead. So when the idea of revolution sparks in Brazil, um, his son kind of gives in to everything, agrees to the Constitution, and again, if he didn't, probably would have been the end of his life and it probably would have turned violent rather than this peaceful, happy Brazilian revolution we have. Anything? Yeah, so very, so very different because it's peaceful. And uh, if you look, go back to the timeline, everyone is fighting for years, uh, but for the Brazilian revolution... Um, they, they only have really one year, perhaps even one day that they organize this. Um, just to correct something I said earlier, I think I mentioned that Mexico achieved their independence in 1824, but it's, it's 1821. Uh, that is not Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo has nothing to do with Mexican uh, independence. And I'm going to, I'm going to pat myself on the back for thinking to put the dots in here since these were specific days or specific years rather than the time frame. So I'm just going to. I'm going to congratulate myself on that one. So anyways, moving on to the last of the revolutions. And Mr. Williams, I am going to let you run with the South American Revolution. Sure. The gentleman on your left is uh, Simone Bolivar. He is uh, educated in Europe. He is a Creole, so he's actually born in, in South America. Um, but he is, again, like Toussaint Louverture of Haiti, uh, very accustomed to Enlightenment ideas, have learned uh, all about the greats really was um, kind of obsessed with Rousseau, if you remember him. Um, but he travels back to South America, uh, wants all of these ideas for his country and his people, because he's identifying himself with Latin America now, unlike his parents. And um, he starts a revolution. And he is, a, almost like Napoleon, a very good um, military strategist. He wins a lot of battles, wins way more than he loses. And he ends up um, liberating uh, most of South America. There's a guy in the South that uh, does a lot as well. His name is Jose, Jose de San Martin. Uh, Argentina is, is, is the big country that he liberates. But um, Bolivar, known as the, the, the liberator, he gets most of the attention and he is fighting for Enlightenment ideas. And we still include in the, the John Locke picture there on the bottom right. Here he is. Here he is. Every time you say revolution, I almost break out singing the Beatles song, which isn't going to be good for anybody's ears if I actually do. Uh, let us be the judge of that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's a quite all right. Um, all right. So for the last um, dot that we've got here is the Monroe Doctrine. So that takes place in 1823, as you can see in our timeline uh, that we've got here. So the Monroe Doctrine is was written in the United States by President Monroe, um, or signed by President Monroe, and it's pretty simple here. The idea is that he's drawing this line, or right here as you see, this dotted line, and tells everybody in Europe, you are not allowed to come over here and tell us what to do anymore. Anybody. Not just us as the United States, but we're saying anybody here or here, it is off limits. So uh, as we see here, the European Europe is saying, what do you mean it is off limits? So that's the Monroe Doctrine that leads foreign affairs and this side of the globe um, and still does today. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's definitely um, still evident. Um, I was watching uh, a documentary on Pablo Escobar the other day. I think I mentioned this in one or two classes because he actually has a lot of things similar to Napoleon. Um, but uh, it was interesting how they, when the Colombian go government couldn't find Pablo Escobar, they were always asking the, the United States for help. Um, they weren't asking for England. They weren't asking for Spain. Um, it's just, 
you know, since the Monroe Doctrine, the United States has just, like you see here, has really kind of claimed it all as, as theirs, and they've been the ones who have been in charge of policing it. So the Monroe Doctrine, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um, as a little side note, if anybody is a soccer fan and at all interested in um, Pablo Escobar, who is the drug lord of Colombia, there's an ESPN 30 for 30 where it looks at um, the Colombian soccer player's last name was Escobar, not related to the drug lord. Um, the Colombia was favored to win the, uh, the World Cup that was in the United States in 1994. Uh, Colombia got knocked out in a big upset and the 30 for 30 talks about the lives of the two Escobars and how they get tangled up and all that. So it's actually really, really interesting for anybody that, again, that's into soccer um, and possibly Pablo Escobar as the, as the drug Lord. So sorry for the tangent. So what do you think, Mr. Armstrong? Are we good? I think we're good. Unless you have anything else to add. Just remember that uh, primary objective, how the Enlightenment ideas affect the independence movements in Latin America. And then you guys will be comparing that to how some of those issues still exist in Latin America today.